and let's sing together.
will stay in my ground where hope can be found. can go ahead and be seated. Um, it has been just a really energetic weekend here in Lubbock, um, a really exciting time in the city of Lubbock. Um, how many of you were up really, really early on Saturday morning? How many of you were really, really up early Saturday morning because you were going to college game day at the, Joan, at the USA? How many of you were up early because you were watching the gold medal match between the United States and Sweden in curling? I was up at 3.30 to watch the national anthem because the United States beat Sweden and we won the gold medal for the first time in United States history. Yes, all right, it was great, it was exciting. I have no idea how the game is played, but I watched the whole thing. They play in ends and not innings, which is weird. I, it, is a, it is a dumb sport, but it was... <laughs> It was great. It is so exciting. It's my kind of game. You can give up. Like, that, is, that was an option. Sweden, they were down 10 to 5, and they're just like, we're, the game's over. It was, it was so weird. I was like, you can do this? Why is this allowed all the time? This is great. Um, but it was, it was awesome. And then college game day was here, and our boys played really hard, and they get, really gave Kansas everything they had. Wasn't enough in the end, but they played really great. We're looking really great for the tournament this year. Give it up for the Red Raiders. Um, we are so glad that you're here recovering from this very exciting sports weekend. If you're a first time guest with us, um, we would really love for you to join our family. Um, we'd really love for you to get on mission with us here at First Baptist. And the best way that you can do that is by downloading the First Lubbock app. You can do that by going to the App Store or the Google Play Store. Um, and whenever you open that app for the very first time, um, there will be a little place called I'm New. And if you click that and you follow the link, it'll take you to a little online form where you just ask for some basic contact information. We'd love to reach out to 
to you. We'd love to um, just talk to you. We'd love to get you plugged into a life group or a community group or one of our Bible studies here and make you part of our family. And uh, one of the best parts about being part of a family here at First Lubbock is that we have opportunities to um, sit with each other and share communion. And we're going to do that tonight at 6 p.m. in Lowry Hall. Um, it's going to be communion around the tables. You're not going to miss it. It's a really cool time. It's very intimate. It's a, it's a great time to share the Lord's Supper. So be here tonight at 6 o'clock for that. We'd really uh, invite any, anybody to uh, come partake in that. Um, and then if you wouldn't mind taking out your uh, smartphone, smart device, or anything like that, you can share the live stream of the service um, using the hashtag cause and effect as Bobby continues his sermon about the gospel and the crowds. And now at this time, you guys can go ahead and stand up and greet the people around you. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. And there is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns And there is freedom from the chains that bind us Jesus, Jesus Who walks on the water, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the night there is a voice that calls a storm and rages and he is Jesus yes Jesus who walks on the water who speaks to the sea who stands in the fire beside me he rolls like a lion and he 
one like you, Jesus. There is no one like you. Sing this truth. Lord, we need you. This morning, let's uh, take our Bibles, our phone, or smart device, whatever it is you use to follow along, and uh, open this morning to uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 13. We continue this uh, idea of the gospel in the crowd, how Jesus spoke uh, to uh, distinctive groups. We saw conversations with individuals. We saw his conversations with religious uh, community, with uh, the religious leaders, and now we're looking at how Jesus spoke and addressed the crowds. And then we will conclude the series with looking at uh, his con uh, conversations and his teaching, uh, specifically for his, uh, his disciples. And uh, let me piggyback on Josh's welcome this morning. Thank you for being here. I invite you to be back tonight uh, for communion down in Lowry Hall at 6 o'clock. Students, we have you out here at 6.30. We're walking out at 6.30 sharp, uh, so you can get back to your studying. Anyway, we'll wrap it up at 6.30. Uh, 
Picasso was not a, a very good math student. Part of the problem was this extraordinary artist, his imagination tended to get in the way when it came to mathematics. Part of the problem was, was that whenever he went to the board to do a math problem given by his uh, teacher, uh, the four, a four, anytime he had to draw a four, it always looked like a nose to him. And so he always felt the need to, to draw in the face. Anytime he drew a four, he would always see a nose and just knew a face had to go with that. Now, I'm sure that, that there were teachers that, that would have reeled in all of that imagination. I'm sure if they'd worked with him a little more, he could have been a very good math student. But, but we would have been deprived the artistry of Picasso. Well, as we come to our text today in Matthew chapter 13 in this parable that, that Jesus tells, really two parables, the parable of the mustard seed in, in verse 31 and then the parable of the leaven in verse 33, uh, I'm going to ask you to really use your imagination. You're going to have to, to, to take what Jesus is saying. You really have to, to imagine it because he's, he's taking things that, that, that the people are familiar with, that they understand that are part of their daily life and routines, but, but he's using it in a way that, that is very unusual. He's using it in a way to talk to them about the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God is like. And so he uses a mustard seed and, and he uses leaven for bread. There, there's some very valuable lessons that can be drawn from this uh, about the life of faith, about our understanding of, of the kingdom of God, what, that, what that's like, what it looks like. But I want you to hear it first in its, in its entirety. He says in verse 31, he presented another parable to them, that is the crowd, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And then the parable of the leaven, verse 33. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now, one of the reasons I say that, that you have to use a lot of imagination in this when Jesus is speaking this parable is that, is that even in this first clause or this first, uh, let's just say this first verse in, in verse 31, where he talks about the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. In ancient days, you really would not take a mustard seed and plant it. No Jew hearing this would have even had the idea of planting a mustard seed in, in his garden. It's not like this beautiful flora that, that, comes, for, that comes forth. Uh, it, it was really the Romans that came to appreciate the benefit of, of mustard. But, but for the Jew that was hearing this, they, they couldn't imagine anything like this. Why would anyone plant a, a mustard seed? For us, it would be, the, the, it would be something akin to, to going out, if you had some, some land, going out and planting mesquite. You just don't do that up here. You know, mesquite just takes over. You have mesquite, people or landowners are trying to get rid of mesquite. Uh, but So this would be the same idea of trying to go out and, and plant mesquite. It just, it just grows like wildfire for those of us from the south. It's like kudzu. You know, you just, uh, they brought in kudzu to plant it in the south to help with erosion. And it's just taken over. I mean, it grows over houses. It grows on, on power lines. It just, it just takes over. And so the audience hearing this would really be kind of perplexed. That's why I say you have to use your imagination. To, to think that, that they would go out and, and plant something, they, they could never imagine this, the idea of someone planting a, a mustard seed. So keeping that in mind and understanding the need for imagination, what Jesus is doing here, there's some very important things that the idea of the mustard seed or the, the metaphor of the mustard seed offers us in our daily life. The first thing that's necessary, notice there again in, in verse 31, what this mustard seed does for us and really what it requires of us is an external vision that as a, a person of faith, I've got to have eyes that see things different. I, I've really got to have some imagination whenever it comes to the, to the life of faith. If the kingdom of God is really going to be manifested, if it's really going to be revealed the way that God would desire for it to be, to be revealed, I, I've got to see things differently. I've got to have a much larger external vision that's required of them here in verse 31 where it says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man 
sowed into his, in his field. It introduces to us unimaginable possibilities. The idea that the kingdom of God is akin to a mustard seed, it introduces to us unimaginable possibilities. The wisdom writer would say that where, it, where there is no vision, the people perish. And that's true not, not just for our lives, our individual lives. It's true for us collectively as, as the people of God, as, as churches, as congregations. It, it's true for business. Any, any organization, if it's going to grow, if it's going to move into a future, it can never stay static. It can never stay as it is. The church has to be something that is very dynamic. We have to keep going into the future that God would have in store for us. The biggest enemy you and I face as a church is the success of the past. Just because something has been successful in the past, that's true for any organization. It's true in corporate America. It's true for any business, any organization. The biggest enemy you will battle is success in your past. Listen, you can be on the right track, but if you're sitting still and just standing there, you're just getting in the way. The people of God have to have an idea and a mentality that we're moving forward. This is a God that is, that is making all things new, the scriptures say. And so it means for us that we have to have an eye to the future. How do I reinvent myself? Not the message of the gospel, not, not the word of God. But understanding that this idea of vision, this is our reach muscle. This is our, this is our reach muscle that keeps us extending and reaching into the future, going out into this place of not knowing. Listen, this is when you get to a, to a difficult place. Most of, you here aren't, most of you here in attendance, by virtue of your age, you're not there yet. But the older you get, one of the things that, that you will have to battle, one of the things that, that you will have to be more intentional about it's not, it's not just em, embracing change, but anticipating change, encouraging change. That's not your tendency as you get older. The tendency as you get older is you want everything to, to remain as it is. Oh, I remember the good old days. Listen, that, that's a telltale sign right there. If you have more memories than you do dreams, you're dying. Individually, collectively, organizationally, if you have more memories than dreams, you're dying. Vision is our reach muscle. And the fact that Jesus says that the kingdom of God is something like a mustard seed, we have to have imagination. We've got to get outside our box. We've got to think bigger. Charles de Gaulle in his autobiography, in response to the question of why didn't France do better during World War II, his answer is educational for every age. He said it's because the generals were wed to the strategies of yesterday. The strategies of yesterday for anything and everything, they work good for yesterday. They don't work for today, they won't work for tomorrow. Strategies. The mustard seed gives us an external vision of possibilities. But it also gives us an internal hope. Notice how Jesus said here in verse 32, he said, and this, and this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This thing that you understand is really having no value. It, it, it's something that, that offers hope. It is something that is used by God to manifest his kingdom. And it gives us this, this hope as, as people, as, as individuals, it gives us this, this hope that, that the seemingly insignificant, that we, not only, that we not only matter, but we make a difference. That the seemingly insignificant, that it not only matters, but it makes a difference and it contributes to the manifestation of the kingdom of God in today's world. See, that, that gives hope. 
Because I think, I think most of us, our mentality is, our thinking is, is that, is that God can't, uh, who am I to think that God could use me? And I get that. I, I get that sentiment. We all have had that thought at some time. Well, who am I to fool myself into thinking that, that God could actually use me? And part of the problem is, is, that, is that you and I live in a very large culture. We live in a very loud culture. We live in a very bombastic culture. We live in a culture that is filled with volume. Everything is filled with volume, vitriol, hostility. Everybody speaks angrily. Everything is loud in our culture. And the mentality of the culture, the commercial effect upon our life is that everything, everything that's bigger is better. I mean, I, I'm around athletes all the time. I mean, athletics has been my life. I mean, we, the mantra has always been go big or go home. That's the culture. But the kingdom of God, listen, don't be duped by that. That may be the cultural reality, but don't be duped into that mindset and that kind of thinking when it comes to the things of God. The kingdom of God is not manifested in glass cathedrals. The kingdom of God is not manifested in, converting, in converted sports arenas. The kingdom of God is manifested in the light in the likes of you and in the likes of me. The seemingly insignificant. Something like, something like a, a mustard seed. Now what Paul said? I mean, Paul would say to the church at Corinth that God is, has chosen what is weak to shame the strong and what is foolish to shame, to shame the wise. Our hope, collectively as, as the church, the message of the gospel, our, our hope is not in the bigness of the world. Our, our hope is not in the grandiose. Grandiose has, never, grandiose has never done well for the kingdom of God. Big has never done well for the kingdom of God. Wealth has never done well for the kingdom of God. Everybody thinks Christianity pulled off a coup back when Constantine made, made Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire. And that is to our detriment to this day. Pope Innocent II, when he was once visited by Thomas Aquinas, the story is, is that when Aquinas walked in, Innocent had before him all the, the vestiges of, of wealth, all the appearances of wealth, gold, silver, money, coins. And he looked up at Aquinas and said, Aquinas, no longer can they say of the church, silver and gold have us none. It's reported that Aquinas' response was, you're quite right, but no longer can the church say, take up your pallet and walk. The church has never done well in history in the grandiose. God has always done his best work. The kingdom of God has been most manifested in our times of smallness, in our time in appearances of weakness. And the mustard seed comes as that reminder of our internal hope that God can use the likes of you and the likes of me to make the kingdom of God known to others around us. A final thing. Another value of this mustard seed in the leaven. Notice in verse 33, it's eternal effect. Just this little bit of leaven. The eternal impact that, that it has. When he says in verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like, is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it, until it was all leavened. Now, when it, when it talks about three pecks of flour here, th this this is a, a, ridicu a ridiculously large sum of, of bread. I mean, th this is huge. This is, like, this is like 39, 40 liters of bread that will feed 40 people three times a day for, for many days. This is a lot of bread. His point is, is just a little bit of leaven has this, has this kind of impact, has this kind of, of effect. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. 
He's saying to the crowd, if you embrace the journey of faith, if you decide to come out of the crowd and start following after me, I want you to know you may seem small, but you're going, you're going to have a huge effect. That the opportunity to make a difference, the opportunity that you have to be an agent of influence used by God, the opportunities are right there before you. Your opportunities are in front of you. Your opportunities are at your feet in the daily intersections of life that you have with others. You have the opportunity in multiple ways to have an eternal impact on the life of others. It's right there in front of you. Russell Conwell is a man who raised a great deal of money in the, for the construction of Temple University in Philadelphia. But he had this kind of signature speech that was titled Acres of Diamonds. And he tells the story of, of this young man he knew that uh, in Massachusetts that, that went to, to Yale and, and pursued the study of, of engineering, mining. He wanted to go into mining precious metals, excelled as, as a student. Even his senior year, he was paid $15 a week to participate in, in a research project. When this student, this young man, finished his, his undergrad, he was offered a generous stipend uh, to do graduate work, master's and Ph.D. work, eventually Ph.D. work, but, but he had been bitten by the gold bug. Turned down that offer, convinced his mother to sell the family farm in, in Massachusetts, and they moved west. But everything he put his hand to was a bus. Conwell said in the last time he had heard about the whereabouts of this young man, he was up in Minnesota somewhere. He was working for some copper mining company making $45 a week. But the, but the man that had bought the family farm some years earlier, soon after he had purchased that family plot, that family farm, he was harvesting potatoes, which are just there on, on the surface under the ground, and he had loaded a bushel basket and put it on his shoulder, and he was walking through a, a stone gate on that property, and he couldn't get the basket through, so he, he set it on the ground and was pushing it through when, when he noticed a, a shiny object in that stone post. Post and archway that were made of, of local stones just taken from, from the land. And just out of the corner of his eye, he caught that shiny piece of, of metal, and it was a block of native silver valued at just over $100,000. And here was this young man that year before, years before, had gone off to study, convinced his mother to sell the family farm. How many times in your imagination had that young man walked through that gate himself? How many times, perhaps, had his sleeve brushed against that, that shiny stone? It's as if the stone was, was shouting at him, your wealth and your opportunity is here, take me. but you're looking somewhere else. A lot of times it's, it's like that in the things of God. We, now I, and I've always said this is our ego speaking. We, we all say in the life of faith, oh, I, want to be, I, I want to be used by God. I want to do something big for God. That, that's our ego. I want to do something big for God. I, listen, I want God to use me to make a difference. I want to be used by God. And I want to do something that, that impacts lives for, for all eternity. And we're always looking to the horizon. Man, I don't want to miss what God has in store for me. And we're, we're always looking to the horizon. Man, I don't want to miss it when it comes. I want to do something big. I want to do something that makes a difference. And we look so far to the horizon that we miss the opportunities that exist at our feet. See, there, there's our mission. That's our mission field. We're, it's where our feet are. 
That's always one of my fears. And all that we do as a church, seeking to be missional, and that's, that's language that we use a great deal around here, that we want to be a missional church, we want to be a missional people. And, and always my fear, and my staff hears us, uh, the staff hears me talk about this all the time, my fear is that, is that, that in all the programming, all the events that we provide for, for mission opportunities, is that I, I have this fear that we start seeing that as an end in and of itself instead of a means to an end. Because really what my hope and desire is, is that as we provide all of these missional opportunities around us, local, nationally, and abroad, the hope and the prayer is, is that when we do those things locally, nationally, and abroad, that, that there's going to be a switch go off in our head for each and every one of us that says, you know, I can do this where I'm at. You know, God can use me where, where I am, where, where my feet are. If I just go out to work every day, as I go to class, as I just go out into the community, wherever I am, God can use me. Because what we're trying to battle is this attitude about missions, that missions is something done by someone else, somewhere else, instead of me where I am. That's really what missions is about. The church is effective in the world only as you consider yourself a missionary, that you're on mission wherever you are. And when we get that, and it makes a difference, you have, you have an eternal effect upon the lives of others. What we need is a planter's mentality. That's what I take from this. That I've got to have a planter's mentality. I've got to have a farmer's mentality that wherever I am, I'm sowing seed. It's a very powerful image because it, it, great many of you here are, are involved in, in farming. You don't farm to the horizon. You don't plant seed. You don't throw seed out to the horizon. You plant seed where your feet are, right? Right in front of you. There's where, there's where the seed's planted. It's where I am. It's a planter's mentality. And listen, here's the amazing thing. When you and I go out in just the routines of everyday life, wherever our life takes us, wherever we intersect with people in the routines of our day, that when we, when we are committed to just planting seeds of kindness, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, when we're just committed, you know, wherever I am, wherever my feet are, I'm just going to plant seeds of kindness, generosity, hospitality. That when we do that, the most barren life, the most barren strip of land can become a garden spot of hope and possibility. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be used by you. That as we look around our, our room this morning, when we're tempted to think that, that we can bring nothing of significance to the table, the mustard seed tells us otherwise. That when we just have a vision, when we just have an imagination of faith, that goes beyond what we can see and what we can imagine. There are endless possibilities. That when we just avail ourselves to you, when we just decide that we're going to be where our feet are and we're going to plant where we are, you can do the unimaginable. Father, we, we're grateful to be a part of this incredible journey of faith. This exciting journey of the pursuit of following after your call that challenges us daily, that whispers in our ear, follow me. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that has never made that commitment in their life, that has never answered that call to follow you, I pray that, that today would be their day, that now might be their moment. For others that know you and have already committed their life to you but need to be a part of a church family that want to join in with us to be a missional people in a missional presence. Father, I pray that they would follow the promptings and the leading of your spirit because we, we know that, that your church, that you have not called us to walk alone. 
which you have called us to walk and to abide and dwell in the company of the fellowship of believers. And so we give this time of, of invitation to you and to the leading of your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For more information, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. Check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15 or 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Download our mobile app to experience even more from First Lubbock. Thanks for watching. God bless and have a great week.